that are meeting, um, the children, the women, the men, the pastor study, all of that is going on. And so um, we invite you to come back and join us for that. And it's been so good to get started again. Um, let's pray this morning. Holy Spirit, you are welcome in this place. Um, as Lord, as we come together to worship you, we pray that your Holy Spirit will just move in us and move through us this morning. And so, Lord God, speak to us, and then um, once you have spoken to us, Lord, use us to speak to others for your sake when we leave. So, Lord God, fill us. Um, fill our hearts, fill our minds with you. We give you ourselves as we worship you. In Christ's name, amen. Well, let's stand, let's sing.
opportunity to pray for my mother. Um, and y'all, I'm going to be honest, over the last several months as my mother has been struggling, as she is now in a nursing home, and I haven't been able to be there with her, and I've only seen my mother once in the last 12 months. Um, you know, I have felt like a failure as a son. I'm just being real. Um, and I want so bad to be able to be there with my mother. But one of the great joys of my life is by being able, to, before we hang up the phone, to be able to pray for my mother. Um, not as a pastor. I'm not her pastor. I'm, I'm her son. And I want to encourage you. Pray for your parents. Pray for your parents. Um, pray with your parents. Not just for your parents, but pray with them. It doesn't matter whether you just stumble all over your life, but it will mean the world to your moms and your dads. Don't call on a preacher to pray for your parents. Pray for your parents. If you can't be with them, pray for them over the phone. And so this morning, I'm going to try something. I'm going to pray for my mother right now. But I want you to be thinking about those individuals in your family that you can't be with right now. Okay? I don't care whether it's a mother or a grandmother or a father or a brother or a sister a child, a grandparent, whoever it is, a sister, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. But I want you to make this prayer your prayer as we pray for those who are dear in our lives. Can you do it? Everybody have somebody in their mind? Let's pray together. Father God, we thank you that, that you are bigger. Lord, that, that there is nothing that, that you can't handle. That the trials that, that our loved ones are going through right now, that, that those health challenges, those emotional challenges, <laughs> those, those physical challenges, those spiritual challenges, Lord God, whatever they are, Lord, we pray for him right now. And Father God, we pray that in the midst of the challenges that they will see you. Lord, that, um, Lord, when they feel all alone, that you tap them on the shoulder and you say, hey, I'm here with you. I, I've never left you. I've never forsaken you. I'm right here with you. And I love you as much today as I did the day you were born. And so, Lord, we pray that you remind our loved ones how much you love them. And, Father God, when they need to know your presence like nobody's business, Lord, we pray that you give them just a humongous bear hug of your love. And that... You just squeeze them like there's no tomorrow. And Lord, hold them tight so that they will know that in your arms that everything is okay. And Father God, we, we pray that you be in their minds. And Lord, that you fill their minds with thoughts of you. Lord, with, with fill their minds with, um, with scripture. Lord, with, with those, those verses, those passages in, in the Bible that some of our loved ones have known for 
years, bring those verses back to their memory and personalize them. And Lord, for those that, like my mother, who grew up in the church, Lord, I pray that you put a song on her heart. Let her sing Amazing Grace today. Right now, Lord, put the words of Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound, on Mama's heart and on her mind. And Lord, just let it be like a broken record throughout today that as she sings that song, that you will reach into her heart and comfort her and give her what she needs most today. And Father God, last but not least, Lord, we pray that you be the great healer. Lord, for the physical problems that our loved ones are going through, for the, 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 um, the emotional brokenness, the spiritual emptiness, Lord, be the great healer and touch them and love them. And Lord, reach into their bodies just like, Lord, how did you, if, if you touch the eyes of a blind man in, in the Word of God where, where he could see again and you touch the ears of a deaf man where he could hear again in the skin of a leper where he was made whole again, Lord God, you can do it again. And mom. And then our grandparents. And our children. And our sisters. And our brothers. And our nieces. And our nephews. And our parents. Father God, we pray that for those that we love so much. Lord God, we pray for them right now. And now I want to invite you right where you are to join me as we pray together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and power and the glory of the Lord. And y'all, by the way, I'm serious as a heart attack. Pray for the parents over the phone. It doesn't or inverse children. Pray for your mom and dad today out loud. That they, they will love. Amen? Okay. Seven weeks ago, I began a sermon series called The Sacred Self. And in this, in this series that we have been talking about these seven I am statements that Jesus made and that are recorded in the Gospel of John. These seven statements that I have been saying that is Jesus' selfie, if you will. Because when you take a selfie and, and you put that selfie on your social media page, it's a picture that you want other people to see. It's a picture of what is important to you. And that selfie, if you will. And I've been telling you over the last, uh, every Sunday during 2021 so far, that these statements that Jesus has been making in the, that are recorded in John's Gospel is Jesus' selfie, 
if you will. And, and these statements um, are earth-shattering. They're life-shattering. When you really take these statements seriously, when you really do take these statements seriously, and they move from your mind to your heart to your feet, it's a game changer. Because everything in your life will change when you really begin to wrap your brain and wrap your heart around Jesus itself. And the statements just by way of review are when Jesus said, I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the gate for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way and the truth and the life. And then I am the vine. Seven times in the Gospel of John, Jesus made these audacious claims. And with each one, it was a claim to be in God. Jesus never said, I'm a good guy. Jesus said, this is who I am. Every one of these statements was a claim to divinity, a claim to be God. It was earth-shattering. It was a game-changer. When you take those claims seriously, it'll change your life. Now, there's one more, but it's not found in the Gospel of John. It's found in the last book of the Bible, the Revelation of John. Earlier, we sang the Revelation song um, by Phillips Craig and Dean. Um, in this service, and it pictures heaven. And, and in the Revelation song, or in Revelation, we, we have one more I am statement by Jesus. Now, this I am statement um, is found three times in Revelation. In Revelation chapter 1, um, Jesus Jesus says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. By the way, you recognize some of that verse right there? It's found in that song that we just sang a few minutes ago. In Revelation 21, Jesus says this. He said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. And then in Revelation 22, beginning with verse 12, Jesus is saying this. Look, I am coming soon. My reward is with me, and I will give to each person according to what they have done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Now these statements, the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end, um, in, in a lot of ways they are saying the same thing, but from a slightly different lens, a slightly different vantage point. Um, these statements um, are life changing, but before we really take a look at it, I want you to step back um, about 1950 some years um, to an isle, an island in the Mediterranean, and the island was called Patmos. Now, John. The same guy who wrote the Gospel of John, we believe, is the one who wrote the received and wrote the Revelation of John. And John was there on the Isle of Patmos. He, by now, he was an old man. Now we don't know exactly, exactly why and everything that precipitated John going to the Isle of Patmos. We don't. But when, we, when you take what we do know and you 
connect the dots, um, we can kind of deduce why John was there. You see, John was an old man. In the early church, the early Christians were under intense persecution. Um, some were killed for their faith. Um, some of the disciples were killed, were martyred for their faith. And that all that means is that, that, that they could have saved their life if they would have chosen to worship the Roman emperor rather than Jesus. But they held true to their faith. Some were killed. Others lost their jobs. Um, if you were a business owner back in that day, and, um, and, and you were a follower of Christ, um, that you basically would lose your business. Others were beaten and persecuted. John was one of the casualties. See, he wasn't killed, but he was sent away to the Isle of Patmos. Now, this is how, where I picture um, John being. I picture John um, being alone um, there on the Isle of Patmos. Maybe in a cave. Um, and then while he was lying there, that a picture of having images flashing across his mind, the people whom he had led to Christ over the years. Some of them had probably already been killed for their faith. Some of them were maybe have been some of the other disciples who had already been killed for their faith. People like James and and others that had already been killed. But I picture him also having these um, images of people that we wouldn't even know who they were that he had led to Christ and, and wondering, lying there in this cave, wondering if they were alive or dead. And I wonder if, if he prayed for their safety. But even more, I wonder if John was praying that their faith would hold up in spite of severe persecution. That's how I picture it. I can't guarantee that's how it, how it was, but it was in the midst of that that Jesus appeared. And Jesus spoke to him. And he introduced himself by saying, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Now, what's up with that? Then he may know it being here in the college town, and um, many of us might know that Alpha is the first letter of the Greek alphabet, right? O Omega is the last letter of the Greek alphabet, but what is all that about? Well, think about it this way. Before children start school, uh, boys and girls, I have a hunch, before you ever even went to kindergarten, you already knew your ABCs. Anybody? Anybody? Yeah, yeah. Now why? Why? Is that, do, do y'all want to sing your ABCs right now? Do you? Yo, I tell you what, boys and girls, come up here. Let's, let's try, all right? Can y'all come up here? Okay. All right. Get up here. All right. Quit. Get up here. 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 No idea. No idea. I have 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 no idea. I 
the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Well, on the one hand, Jesus being fully God, that means that he was with God in the beginning. One of the core Christian beliefs is that Jesus is eternal. And that means that there was no beginning, no end. I, I can't comprehend that with my finite human mind, but Jesus wasn't created. One of the most common questions that I've been asked over the years in confirmation classes and in, from children and from, from teenagers and occasionally from adults, who made God? Nobody made God. He has always been. When Adam took his first breath, Jesus was right there. In John chapter 1, verse 2, we read that Jesus was with God in the beginning. If you want to know when the beginning was, go all the way back to Genesis chapter 1. In the beginning, the earth was formless and empty. Jesus was with God in the beginning. So what's the end? What's the end referring to? Well, in a nutshell, the second coming. When Jesus comes back, um, is what the end is referring to here. In Revelation 22, verse 12, Jesus is speaking. He says, look, I am coming soon. My reward is with me. And I will give to each person according to what they have done. You know, throughout Scripture, um, the second coming is talked about a lot. Now, there are, I've seen two basic approaches to the second coming among Christians. Okay? You may have a different opinion on it, but this is just what I have observed. I may be wrong. But on the one hand, some Christians accept the fact and just go, you know, I'm never going to understand it anyway, so even though I know it's going to happen, I just ignore it. And I just go on and live my life because I know I'm not going to understand it. I try to read Daniel, I try to read Revelation, and it's just, you know, it's just way over the top of my head, and, and so I don't I don't understand it, so I'll just ignore it. That is one group of Christians. There's another group of Christians that love to spend their time looking for signs, trying to match things up in Revelation with what they see happening today and looking and interpreting the signs and trying to figure out the order in which things are going to happen. And they'll spend time arguing about what, was, what is going to happen and when it's going to happen and, and all of that. Back in, um, back in my earlier life, I remember sitting on a bar stool in a bar um, and arguing with other people out there in the bar, all of us have had a little bit too much to drink. And, and we were arguing about the second coming. Um, and so I see two, um, two primary things going on. Some ignore it, others are crazy about it. Trying to figure it out. Mm. In my opinion, there's a better approach. Both of them, I think, have got good qualities and not so good qualities, but in my opinion, there's a better approach. And I think we can go back to some of the ancient creeds of the church. 
Um, these statements of faith that Christians throughout the ages have, um, have used to profess their faith. In the Nicene Creed, one of the ancient creeds, and we'll use this occasionally in the 11 o'clock service, but we will say this, that he, referring to Jesus, will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead. In the Apostles' Creed, some of you that, um, that have grown up in a Methodist church or some other denominations, you may have said this creed most every Sunday in church. But this is one of those statements that we say, from thence he, referring to Jesus, shall come to judge the quick and the dead. And quit literally means living, not one that can get out of the way really fast. But literally living. I believe that we would be much better off rather than arguing about the order that something is going to happen or much better off than ignoring what's going to happen to take the old ancient creeds and let that be part of my part of their life. Now I'll be the first to admit that I don't know a lot about the second coming. Some people are really, really confident. Some of those guys on those bar stools that I mentioned earlier. They were really confident that they knew when things were going to happen. Okay? They knew how it was going to happen. They knew what this earthquake that just happened not too long ago, what that was referring to in the book of Revelation. They knew it and they were confident. Uh, I've never been so confident in my life, but there are three things that I will, that I believe with all my heart. Number one is that no one knows when Jesus is going to come back, but he will return. No one knows when. Jesus said in Matthew 24, verse 42, he said, Therefore keep watch, because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. No one knows when, but he will come back. <coughs> Second thing that I know, there is no crystal clear scriptural picture of how it will happen, of how it will all unfold. There is no crystal clear picture. You see, there are strong believers that um, believe that one day there's going to be a rapture. Rapture being when Jesus comes back and all the dead in Christ will rise, will meet him up in the air. Okay. And there are other, in my opinion, equally strong Christians who aren't so sure that there's going to be a rapture. For those who do believe that there's going to be a rapture, some believe that it's going to happen before a thousand year period of tribulation. Others believe the tribulation is going to come first. And still others believe that will, the rapture will occur sometime in the middle of the tribulation. And the interesting thing, there are Christians that are way stronger than I will ever be that adhere to all of those beliefs. Because there is no 
crystal clear picture in Scripture of how things will all unfold. The last thing is this. In light of all this, how shall we live today? You see, the main question about the second coming isn't when or even how. But the main question is, what will Jesus find us doing when he comes back? What will Jesus find us invested in when he comes back? What's going to be our priorities when he comes back? And what will Jesus find us doing when he comes back? Go back to the two creeds. You've got the words in both creeds. And here in Revelation 22, it says that when Jesus comes back, he's going to judge us. What's that going to look like? Well, my hunch is he's going to judge me for what I'm most invested in. And he's going to judge you for what you are most invested in. Jesus says, I am the Alpha and the Omega. The A to Z. Not the A to G or the A to C or the A to L if the really, really spiritual. But the A to Z. The beginning and the end. There's only one thing that's going to matter at the end and that's what have we done and what are we doing with Jesus everything else that is such a priority today will it be a priority when Jesus comes back I am the Alpha and the Omega the first and the last. The beginning and the end. You see, without Jesus, there is no life. I want to invite you to stand with me. Thank you. 